So for today, we're going to be continuing our topic from last week, which was China, Chinese history, the history of China. And as we remember from last week, we ended off by talking about the Han Dynasty split into three different parts. This is still Stephen's dry erase marker too. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask people online and in person, what do you guys remember from last week? I wasn't or here last week. week. I was at soccer. A Kahoot. Kahoot? Yeah. There was no, yes, there was a Kahoot last week, but the last week Kahoot was actually on the history of Korea, which was last, last week's past topic. Anybody remember anything from the first part of China? The Xiao Dynasty was the first dynasty. Sorry, did you read the, the which dynasty? The first dynasty was the Xiao Dynasty. Close, it is actually Xia. the Xia Dynasty. So you guys yeah, can't think, what I'm writing on the I board. I think that's what I meant. And the Xiang Dynasty was the first dynasty to be recorded. Yes, that's correct. So the Xia Dynasty is backwards, but. The Xia Dynasty, that's correct, is the first dynasty to be recorded. Sorry, the Xia Dynasty was the first dynasty to exist. Do you remember, it was it a myth, a legend, or some a factual? Factual. A legend? A legend, that's correct. This was a legend. It wasn't confirmed, so... Yes, so we cannot confirm the exact dates of the Xia, or if the Xia ever existed. Let me try this. Maybe this will let's see better. There we go. Now you guys can see that, right? Oh, I can't see. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> all right, so we have the Xia Dynasty, where we knew it was a legend, and we had Yilin. What was the next one that we know it's for a fact? Shang. Yes, the Shang Dynasty was the next dynasty after the Xia, and we knew that the Shang Dynasty was historically correct. Does anybody remember why? Somebody yes. wrote about it? Is there like true shows and stuff from it? That's correct, yes. So there's actually two parts. We learned about a book, which we're going to be learning more about today, and turtle shells. Because turtle shells last a very long time. Turtles themselves live up to 100 to 150 years old, and their shells, well, they can last much longer than that because it's actually bone. It's just like how we have bones of dinosaurs, right? They last a long time for, uh, for us to ex uh, explore it and discover it. They're basically like exoskeletons. That's correct, yes, absolutely. All right, with that, let's move on to today's topic. And as Camille said, or was it, sorry, I forgot who said that. Was it Elin online or something? We, we're going to be talking about books. And yes, books are one of the reasons why we know this exists and why this might exist. All right, so we're gonna move on to the great books of China. And I just realized that I actually have to erase this by hand because I'm not online. I just press it and erase it. You need to erase white things. Could, could, you, could you pass me the wet wipes <laughs> in the box? No, no, so no, when you wipe it, you can't write on it anymore. <laughs> Imagine if there were such things that Insta erasers. Yes, it's called a digital whiteboard. <laughs> no, like for real life instead of like. Yeah, but I can't afford that, so I have this thing that barely erases because it's bad. All right. Okay. So our first chapter of today's class is on the great books of China. So, as we learned last, well, just now, that the Shang Dynasty was proven to be historically correct through Tudor shells and also books. Which book to be exact? Well, let's talk about the author first, all right, before we talk about the book. The author's name was Sima Qian. He was basically named the greatest historian of China, which means that he's pretty important because if you're named the greatest of anything, you have to be kind of important, right? So the book he wrote is called Shi Ji. And Shiji just means the record of the grand historian. What you I thought you said Sima Guan instead. Yes. So let's write that out. So this translates to the records 
of friend history, which isn't really the direct translation from Chinese. And you can kind of see that the British people have really romanticized him, putting him as the grand historian, really writing everything down. Yes? I don't think they can see it. Can you guys see it? Yeah, we can't see it. Can you just lower it? Yeah, that's good. Sorry. All right, so as I was saying, the British, or whoever translated this book into English, which is maybe possibly in the 1800s and the 1700s, called it the grand historian, which is kind of accurate if we, if we actually think that he's the greatest historian of China. All right. Brendan, can I have you not drawing on the board, please? Thank you. Okay. So the Chinese name of the book again is Shi Ji, and it is basically a history book of ancient China. And it's through his book that we know that the Shang Dynasty actually existed. Well, of course, that and the turtle shells. What else is very interesting about this character is that his book is a hundred percent accurate, which not all books are. When the book is about history of the own country, we kind of exaggerate a bit. But if it's 100% accurate, then we can actually prove the existence of the Xia dynasty. Because, well, it's kind of like extrapolating your data. We're kind of guessing and checking. If we guess that all of his stuff about the Xiang was correct, and we can actually check that it is correct, then we can guess that the Xia dynasty was correct. And we can, with a lot of confidence, say that the Xia Dynasty actually existed when there's not actual what's called first-hand historical record, which is like turtle shells, actual books written through that time, and any, anything from that time, pottery, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that's this pretty great historian. And he's also considered the father of Chinese historiography, which again comes back to this greatest historian title. Just meaning that he's very, very young. Yes? Uh, what period did he live in? Good question. So he lived uh, around the Western Han Dynasty, which is around 250 AD, which is, if you think about it, if uh, China started 25 years ago. So if he can find data and prove an accurate around 2000 AD, that is very impressive because back then, there's nothing to write on. Again, it's turtle shells, which still degrades over time. We can still find the turtle shells, but the, uh, a lot of words, a lot of language, language changes. Like Latin, most of you guys, or I, I'm probably thinking most, of, all of you guys don't know how to read or write Latin. Same thing with Sima Qian and his era, because 2000 years ago, there was the Shang, the Shang Dynasty. And he had Igpe no Latine. Um, Sorry? Igpe Latine. Yes, that's pit Latin. That is definitely very different from actual Latin. All right. What's so, pig Latin? Pig Latin is whenever you take a word like um, uh, zoom yeah. and you move the last, first, sorry, the first letter to the last letter, you get ooze and you just add ooze. So zoom becomes ooze a. So if you Bob, kind of done. So if it's Bob, it's Ubi. Uh, then what about supercalifragilisticexpialidocious in Pig Latin? Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. I was fine you so when you would ask <laughs> that. Yeah. Can you also right. write it on the um the computer because I imagine like the camera's a little bit like. The screen that's projecting is a little bit small for us, kind of. Yes, I, I could write on the screen, that is right. But then you guys won't be able to see the screen or see me. So you'll just be able to see my nose if I use my iPad. <laughs> and it's a better experience for people here, all right? So compromise, which is basically told like the whole world is. Okay, any questions about this? Guy? No. Uh, pretty grand. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, like what dynasty did he live in? Yeah. The Western Han Dynasty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think. Han. Yes, it's Han in Chinese, like... but 
we do something called romanticize the language. And that's the longest the dynasty. Yes. Oh, but then how does he like go back? He doesn't go back. He reads other people's books and he listens to people's stories. Stories before there was actually written language or when languages change are carried through uh, stories of grandparents. So the grandparents of the time might explain the story and well, the stories will be told down generation to generation. And what Sima Qian did was basically he wrote all those stories down. And well, he at the time could not really know if it's 100% historically accurate, but all he could do was take a guess. And based on the book and current findings with current technology and current computers, we can say that his predictions were pretty accurate and on point. Imagine what it would be like if he, if people could live for a thousand years. Yeah, but yes, that is also a problem. Overpopulation. Or population death, which is another topic biology, maybe somebody else will argue later on. All right. The military would have tons of soldiers then. Because like... But if, <laughs> let's, let's move that topic because that topic gets into a lot of things. And the primary reason for that is that it gets back into a lot of things about living a thousand years old. Uh, and well, that's not really the topic here, right? Okay. So as I was talking about was Sima Qian. And Sima Qian wrote the book called Shi Ji, or the, basically the greatest record in the grand record of the, sorry, Chinese history based on the records of the grand historian. However, there's three more other books, historical books, that was as important to Chinese history. And those three books are the last one. Book of Han, the, uh, or the history of the book of the we had former Han. This is not how you look at it because the second book is titled The Book of the Later Han or the Latter Han. Depends on if you're British or not. So, the book of the Latter Han, what it basically is, uh, is, is the kind of the second version of the Book of the Former Han because the Book of the Former Han was written during the Former Han. The Book of the Latter Han was written during the Latter Han. So, let's talk about these two books first. These two books were written around 111 BD. And basically, one. sorry? That's a lot of ones. Yes, that's a lot of ones. Six, six, However, is the, this a coincidence? The latter Han, which is actually a larger book, was written in six. Sorry, this is should be easy. This is. So, these two books written during this time basically it is a supplementary to Shi Ti. Shi Ti was written before this, and I remember Preston asking about when it was written. I wrote 250 AD for some reason by a brain and numbers, but it should be 250 BC. So I actually came before this. So all this book really did was, yes, sorry. So what this book basically was, was these two books were taking it into account of all history again. And with all history, they are basically recollecting it and with a hundred or two hundred, basically 250 years of technological advancement and everything, they were able to create more uh, complete documents of the time. Wait, why does it say books of the millennium? Because they span almost 2000 years. Do, do you know what millennium stands for? How many years does it stand for? Oh, 1000. Yes, right? So book of the millennium, because it spans a thousand years, it, so the books themselves are almost 2,000 years old, and the books, the, the 2,000 year old books cover another 2,000 years. But so, I have a question. So, yes. look, if, but if you have like the former, the book of former Hong, uh, 101 BC, but then why is that one 250 BC? Sorry, so 250 BC was the this book. Remember? This oh, book. yeah. This right. book was 250 years old. Sorry, not 250 years old. 250 written in 250 BC. And while the other books, this book was written 100 years later, 
this book written another hundred years later. Yes, Preston? Uh, was there a reason why um, there was a book before Mahan and then a book of later Han? Was it a different period? And so Good question. Yes. So, as we learned before, there was three different Han periods we learned this past week. And of course, we had the former, the middle, and the non, and the later or latter Han. And basically, the former Han was so the Book of Han was basically a way for the emperor to prove that he has the rightful uh, place to rule. So what he did was he asked his royal historians, royal bookkeepers, to go and search all of the documents that he can, and to write these two books to prove his lineage and to basically write down Chinese history. Because throughout history, and throughout Chinese history to be exact, uh, writing documents and basically having this pride of your lineage and knowing where your people or for the emperor where his basically family came from is very important to establish something we call the mandate of the heaven. Which basically meant that because I am from this lineage, the heavens, or basically the gods, gave me the right to rule, that I am the rightful ruler. Yes. Imagine why. Which one? The why. The. <laughs> there we go. All right. Okay. Yeah. So that is why there was split into two books, and basically the former Han collapsed before they were finished. So the book of the modern Han was basically saying that here's book two. <laughs> I bet that and, the like yeah. the least luckiest year would be six six six. Well, to be honest, for Chinese people, the Number six is lucky, right? The number 666 is only unlucky for Western four, cultures. Four. Yes, so the 444 four, four would be the unlucky. Or anything with four. 1414 is also pretty unlucky. Right? But yeah, but for Western culture, that would have been like 513 because, yeah, well, that's actually a newer uh, superstition for like Friday is, the 13th. What about six? Is that, I don't notice, but like, my, is it true that is it true that Chinese people think thirteen is a lucky number? No, thirteen is Western culture, right? So that's why you don't see thirteen in sometimes hotels. They have twelve A and twelve B. Same thing in China too. So for the four four, they would remove it. They have four three eight, four three B. So it's super yeah, it's superstition, which if it's a topic for another time. It doesn't that make is. any sense to me. Why yes. would people? Oh, um, I do understand the four. Yes. So a superstition is okay. something we believe in that really can't be made sense through science. All right. So let's move on to the last book, then, which is the records of the three kingdoms. That's a day. Three, day. three yes, three kingdoms. Three, um, but that also refers to a period. Three, um, period um, which is that's three like. Kingdoms. Oh. In Japan, uh, uh, close Korea. Korea also had it, as we talked about on the second class. Korea has a three kingdom here, but that three three kingdom here isn't as famous as Wait, the Chinese. What's Cao Cao in yes, Korea? that's correct. We had Cao Cao, right? Okay, Liu Bei. Oh yeah, Liu, I heard that. Does anybody know the third one? Oh. Huh? No. Anybody? I think it starts with a. I don't know what it starts with. All right. Well, we're going to be watching a video. So let's see if you guys can figure that out. Mm. All right. Mm. So this is actually. So we know the book called San Wo Yi, which mm. in English mm. translates to The Romance of the Three. Mm. This is actually the book that that's based on. All of the his history mm. and stories from that book are, well, seems very interesting, right? With uh, if you guys I maybe know somebody called Zhu Geliang being this insane expert tactician that can basically beat everybody out through just pure skill. He had no skill with the sword, he just had his brain. He was able to beat the, basically the best army uh, single-handed. And of course, those are, you know, exaggerated for a better story. But this is very boring to read, and, but that is the legit history and the facts based on it. So most of you will be reading the romance of the three kingdoms, right? So that leads us, of yeah, course, to the three kingdoms. Yes, that leads us definitely to the three kingdoms period. 
Right? Hey, who's Cao Pi? Cao Pi was the son of Cao Cao. Oh. Oh, you see. Oh, yeah. Same right? All right. So let's move on to this period, the, the three periods. And we had Cao Wei, Liu Bei, and the third person, Sun Quan. Well, kind of spoils it but because that's the thumbnail for the video. I have no choice. I completely forgot. So Cao Wei, which was the emperor Cao Pi, and Liu Bei, right, for the, basically the, it's called the king of the Han Zhong, which is mm -hmm. what the country is called. And we had Sun Quan, which doesn't really matter. He's kind of the third wheel of the whole combat. It's usually between Cao Cao and Liu Bei, which is all the good stories about. Mm -hmm. Yes? Did Genghis Khan try to invade one China once? Yes, later on, all right? We're going to be talking Many about times? That. Not for many times, but for one very long time. <laughs> All right. So with that, let's see if my hyperlink works. Let's just talk through it. Uh, I'll basically explain most of it. We had Cao Cao, part of the Cao Wei, when right? Liu Bei leading basically what's called the Han Zhong War, basically the middle of the Han. Basically, they think that they're the rightful ruler of China, which Liu Bei technically was. He was the grandson of the uncle that ruled the previous kingdom, which was the Han. That's why he called himself Han Zhong, basically thinking that he had the rightful rule. And basically Sun Quan is this person that was very good, a very, very, very brilliant military leader that thought that he could just take over using his military might. But of course we learned that this game is technically still a political game, so politics means everything. And Liu Bei actually had a lot of backing of a lot of, uh, I guess, the, the regular people. Your everyday civilians mm -hmm. and peasants, because again, with the mandate of heaven, they think that because he has the lineage of the previous ruling and the previous period or previous dynasty, he should be the right ruler. So, if you read the romance of the three kingdoms, you'll see that Liu Bei and basically Zhu Liang is portrayed as this basically this hero of the sword, and Cao Cao basically seen as this villain, villain which. But we learned in history that usually there isn't really a hero in the All right. Any questions on that? No. Yeah, like Sangwo Yi or that book really over exaggerates it. Yes, that's why it's called the romance of the three kingdoms. The actual book, as we learned before, is the records of the three kingdoms, not mm. as romanticized and, of course, not as fun. Why Question? is it romance? Because it, it's an English word for romanticized. It's a way to say that you, you make something more beautiful and basically better to read. What was the kingdom that collapsed last? Uh, you mean like, uh, oh, out of the three? Te uh, technically, Cao Wei really didn't collapse. Yes, we'll talk about this later. But basically, with the emperor, Cao Cao died, handed off to his son Cao Pi. But Cao Pi was really powerless. He wasn't really built to be a ruler, very spoiled, and well, he had to rule since very young, so he didn't really have experience. So we we'll learned later on that this Jin dynasty basically took over everything else. Because we had, as you guys remember, we have Cao Wei. Let's just write that down before it disappears on us on the next slide. Cao Wei basically was the uh, the state's name or the empire's name. And well, how did it get into the Jin Dynasty? Well, it's small. Yes, very, very small. But hopefully you guys can see it because I'm also sharing the presentation. Well. Yes. So basically, how this person, a, uh, a part of the Jin Dynasty, was able to take over from Cao Wei was actually the, the son of Cao Pi, who we learn again, called Cao Huan. Sorry, He's, there's so many names that I don't remember. But Cao Huan, basically, he was even weaker than his father, and the father was weaker than the grandfather. The grandfather was a brilliant ruler, but then we have this Cao Huan, which basically had no power. His, his kingdom all took over, and basically, he was forced to abdicate power to uh, Slip Ma. So, let's remember that. Yes? Like, I, and then, like, I think, like, he, and then, like, he invaded everything. Yes, that's correct. That's how he took it. Yes. Isn't even pin yourself? 
Sorry? I think you can pin yourself there. Right. Would you like to do it? Yeah. Okay, great. You can do that. So let's keep going. So we talked about what Sima took over from Chou. So who Sima is, was there's this person called Sima, Sima Qian, right? There, there's a few Simas. There's Sima Qian, which we'll learn about, Sima Yan, and basically Sima Zhao. And, and Sima Guang. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what's so funny about this, it? This kind of, I guess, I don't this know. last name and this kind of family in a way where but Sima Guang really isn't related here. So what uh, uh, really Sima Yan was able to do with the help of his father was force Cao Huan to abdicate and for basically say that you can still be technically the emperor, also give you all the money you need, you can keep your palace. But you'll do everything I want you to do. So basically, Cao Huan and Cao Bing had no real power. They were basically puppets for the Sima family, whether it was Sima Zhao or Sima Yin, which technically was the one basically said, Yeah, screw this system. I don't even want to be the, the puppeteer. I want to have a face. I want to become the emperor. The reason mm -hmm. why it took basically a generation for them to think that I can finally become the emperor was again the mandate of the heaven. The mandate of the heaven thought, well, because Cao Cao actually took over the whole place, he had now the rightful rule to the country. And this random person, which is basically his counselor and his consultant, who was more powerful than the emperor himself, was something that regular people, the civilians, and basically all of the people couldn't fathom or basically understand. And he, they didn't really want that to happen. So that's why Sima Zhao and Sima Yan had to rule from the back for a while before they presented themselves. Question. All right. Any questions on this? I have a question. Yes. Is it kind of like Pope over Emperor and o Emperor over Pope? Yeah, uh, yes and no. So basically the Emperor, there, there isn't really a religion in China, right? The most we had was Buddhism, but that was usually supported by the Emperor and they didn't really have a lot of power. What he really was, was basically just a consulting, consultant, saying basically a strategist in a way, but basically the general of the strategists. Yes, Harry? I said there wasn't a pope in China. Yes, there's no pope. So there wasn't even a religion in China. Yeah, what pope? How is the Jin Dynasty going to name? Good question. So the Jin Dynasty basically got, a, got its name because they really can't use Sima, because you can't really call yourself the Sima Dynasty. Because technically, they didn't deserve it. They took, they abdicated it from the throne. So basically, back then, they were pretty superstitious, as we say. So is it, is, there isn't an exact date on it, but basically, mm. Sima went to one of those people that th mm. think of them as the wizards of that time. They actually believed in it, that they could do something called Xuan Wang, which is basically know what um, kind of like the elements that you're born. What elements uh, work with you, what elements don't. Kind of like the avatar mm. like, in, in real life. So what happened with the Jin Dynasty was that they were like, yeah, that just sounds good. Let's just take it. There's not really an exact way. They just, their dynasty just can't be, uh, overlap another dynasty. So they can't just name themselves Han Dynasty again because that existed. But that rule kind of gets broken later on because people stop caring about superstition. I have a question. Yes. So... Uh, over here, like this is like still. So like the other parts are still China. So what happened in there? Yes. Oh, so actually, so this part isn't China, right? This is this is modern China. So come down here. You know, we have that. That's down here. This the is great, modern China. What is the Great Wall? So the China? yellow was actually just how big China was back then. Because you have to remember that China didn't have all this kind before. China started off basically this big. Small. And they started expanding, expanding. Actually, sorry, they started like in the middle along the Yangtze River, right? And also the, the Long River, the Changjiang. So those are the two rivers. Yeah, that people, yeah, yeah, the Yangtze River. Which is like, oh. Because if you guys remember from the first cousin, most agriculture and most large civilizations have to rely on river because it provides them silt. And silt is very important in creating any type of crops. Yes? Silk road reference. That silt isn't the best. There's an even better one. 
Yes, but you have to remember back then they didn't have technology. So silk was the easiest to create too, because it was naturally occurring. They didn't have to do anything. They just had to live in a good region and they're set. This is why the Silk Road was created, probably. No, it's because China is a, the one of the only places which has silk. Yes, that's correct because the worms that create silk are native to China. And because, and, and milkweed. Yes, that's correct. So if you've been in school in China. No, it's not milkweed. You would have done an experiment collecting silk from a sofa. Yes. I know like they love your mother making like a nickname for the yellow river, which is not simple. Yes, because, yes, as that translates to is the mother river, because basically it nurtured the entire river. It's yeah. like, it's basically like, it basically helps people live. Yes. All right, Preston. Um, at, like, what dynasty did the, uh, the the China lose its like inner, like its outer Mongolian? Outer like this? Yeah. Pretty late on. Uh, exact dates I'm not sure, but it was right before the Qing. So China, well, technically. There's something even after Outer Mongolia. Outer Mongolia, they lost because of basically the Mongolians. But you have to remember after the Mongolians, the Mongolians didn't really leave really forceful. So they came conquered, of course, very brutal, but they kind of just integrated with Han Chinese people. So you really couldn't tell who was who. And that's why we have minority groups right now. So they were kind of really peaceful. Uh, until we'll learn about later on, there's this group of people that are like, yeah, we want to take over again because you know, Han supremacy or something like that. And as we know from all dictatorships and or racial genocide or whatever, that never works. Uh, but we'll worry about that. What if? You can't pin yourself when you're not the host. That's fine. All right. So yeah. So actually, this is something I don't cover, but just a fun fact. This, does anybody know what that region is? The Great Wall. Yeah. What if? The Mongolian. Okay. Trying to flip that part. Well, Mongolia That's got fine. invaded by China, and China won somehow. Around the 1960, 1957, if I'm correct, is when they fought Tibet, or fought, but they really just rolled their tanks through and says, "Well, you either die or you sell us the end of our two dollars." <laughs> so I don't think there's really a deal to it. So no, like Tibet. No, no, like classical China. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tibet. So that's why there was a lot of sanctions put on China, but because that was during the Cold War, they just saw that as communism. So they, they really couldn't fight because they thought that if they try to fight back in Tibet by like sending American troops from like say Vietnam over or just from Europe over to help you save so Tibet so over from China, they might incur the wrath of Soviet Union so and the Red Army. And yeah, they were afraid of that. So they wanted Soviet to do it. Soviet Union doesn't exist. Not anymore, but during that 1960s, they did exist, right? And yeah, so back then, Soviet Union was really, really powerful. So they didn't really want, again, it's the Cold War. They didn't really want a war. They just wanted to be cold. They just wanted to be basically a steering contest. And Tibet wasn't really important to them. It wasn't really there. It was just a communist government trying to take more land. Cold so War? Yes? So if you wanted to make it a staring contest, where was the place? To do the staring contest. To do the staring contest? Basically, it was just a military it's battle. Exactly. So they didn't really stare at each other. But if you want to talk about the staring contest, that they stared, basically they stared at each other in the Middle East. They had tanks on both sides. Nobody will do it. That's the closest to an international staring contest you can get, right? We also have, have Vietnam. That was less of a staring contest, more of a... I'm trying to burn you with my laser eyes contest. <laughs> also with Korea, right? Same thing there. But everything else, we have Afghanistan, we have Israel, all of these. Yeah, those are pretty calm here. The Afghan war. Yeah. I heard that. Wait, who? Hmm? I, where is, what? Where is it? Japan? Japan's over right I heard that Chinese don't like Japan. Yes, and that we're going to learn about later on. Wait, but they didn't nuke it, right? US nuked Japan. Why? Because of Pearl Harbor. 
So Japan basically sent two little, six, seven little ships over to US. No, basically like, like, on Hawaii like a bunch of back. aircraft Yay, carriers. Bombed US. And US are like, nah, we did it. We bombed their whole city. And basically they lost like ships. But US first, they lost like two millions. It's basically for for Hawaii. They bombed basically like one city, Hawaii. What are we doing with It's city. basically a revenge. Yeah, and it was the fattest revenge ever. This is literally, like, if you know, like, this is basically the top 10 moments of history where they just bombed them out of nowhere. Like, for fact, you know that the that US actually didn't have a third bomb to bomb uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. <laughs> so if Japan didn't uh, surrender after the two nuclear bombs, USA was out of it. They basically made three bombs. That's all the uh, plutonium and uranium they could basically extract. And first one was a test bomb just to make sure that it actually blew up and not in their faces. And they dropped the other two. So basically, uh, this is hard. them. Hope, hopefully, they explode and not they, right in their faces when it's in testing. The first bomb because nobody has seen a nuclear bomb before. But Japan held up to the second one. To be honest, yeah, if they didn't surrender at the second one, U.S. wouldn't have a third one. Well, they would have. So, but like, so basically, more. Japan ate two nuclear bombs right in their face. Yes, and they're like, eh, maybe we should surrender, maybe not. Which is not something that will ever happen anymore. So it's yeah. like you, Japan kicks the U.S. in the feet, and then and then U.S. just kicks his face. Not even that. So basically. At this, yeah, if you want to do a scale, Japan basically just touched uh, US <laughs> and US just slapped Japan unconscious, basically. What does USSR mean again? Uh, the United Soviet Social Russia? Russia? Russia. 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 Yeah. Oh. Not really great with my acronyms. This United is not big, I don't know. Soviet Social in. Republic. Okay. Yes. So we have the, the North and the Southern dynasties. Before this, basically, there was 16 dynasties uh, that was split in two. And the 16 basically became two, and two became one. Um, it's very complicated. It's not, there's not really a lot of historical uh, or anything important that happened. It was just, I'm a tribe, I'm a tribe. And basically, they're like, yeah, the Jin dynasty wasn't good. Not really my emperor. That's what they thought. So like I'm gonna be my own emperor. So sixteen like, different countries. Like that's kind of like, like you can just split them up. That's kind of like North Korea and South Korea. <laughs> South Korea is different. This is just different tribes just trying to make. I think like, it's kind of like North one. Korea and South Korea, but way Fine. bigger. Sure, something like that, right? But they didn't really have a war. Just a little uh, war. Better. Like basically. A few, like one or two of them basically survived for two years. That's it. So yeah, if you want to know, this was during like 440 BC. Sorry, not BC. I was talking about Common Era, which is the 80, and basically yeah, nothing really happened there. Let's keep going to the oh, Sui Dynasty. Yeah, the most. The Sui Dynasty is actually a very important dynasty, but also a very brutal dynasty. The Sui Dynasty was from uh, 581 to 6. So a pretty short six years. So a very short dynasty. If you guys can do math, that's what. 30, 37 years. But I thought there was like not even China dynasty. There was a dynasty that lasted one one year. It probably one and a half. Probably like probably some of these lasted for a few months. I deserve that. But yeah, so for the Sui dynasty, lasted for thirty seven years. And basically, they reunited the northern and the southern dynasties. This doesn't look like China. This is China, but this is modern China. We're going to learn about one. Yes. Isn't there like two sweet dynasties? Or two sweet dynasties? So, sweet and the Song are different. But there's also the natural sweet and the latter sweet, which gets kind of categorized as basically the latter dynasties, where basically there Wait, was the Renaissance off? period of all the previous dynasties. And basically, their great 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 grandson thinking that, is that I want to take over and reunite my family. And my is that so Yes, basically, battles of the wars. So um, this is not actually long before. What? Yes, this it's is in Wu. 
And this is handmade. This is a canal that they built. What? They dug this uh, in Luoyang. And this is a very famous, uh, basically, place in Luoyang. And this is basically this street is called Pichet. Right shovels, shovels, or machinery. Shovels. Grand, the Grand Canal. They use shovels to. Yes. So they well, have slaves. Right. Yes. Let's finish the story. All right. So the story goes that uh, there is this em uh, empire, basically the emperor of the Sui Dynasty. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah. So there's two people. Yang Jie, his first person, and his son, Yang Guang, which sounds like son. Is <laughs> so these two people are basically all Sui dynasties, just two people, because of course, just 37 years. Did they all die? Not exactly. His, again, father, father, very powerful person. And basically, what? what they did is they built the canal. Two things: they built the canal, the Great Canal, the Grand Canal, and the Great Wall. Rebuilt the Great Wall. So basically, half of the Great Wall we know today is from the Sui Dynasty. So almost the previous Great Wall we learned last week about the Qin Dynasty doesn't exist anymore. Question: Sorry? I think the slaves that made the Great Wall also. Helped make the Great Canal. Yes, that's right. Or not yes, help. Yes, half, half and half. If they survived from building a Great Wall, they built the Grand Canal. And basically, half the people died here, half the people died there. If you're lucky to survive, you're like, you told a great story. I have quest of Shen. Are, are, there, are there still remnants of the Grand Canal? Here? This is the Grand Canal. And this right is now. It's still here. Where? In Luoyang. And actually, it's really, it's basically from sea to sea. Think about it as the Panama Canal, but just times that by, let's say, 100. So all man dug, and it's large enough to like fit big boats in. These are just like, the island they built it. I, I remember when I did a little, I remember when I did a, like a little, I made a little yeah. like small screen, and I was like, Hmm. I wonder if anybody made this book bigger yeah. using a all shovel. Right. All right, let's limit you to one yeah. story per slide, all right? Because we still have some things to get through. All right, let's answer Brendan's question before we move on. Is, is some parts, are some parts of Russia like from, are a part of like Eastern Asia? Yes, uh, Russia is part of Eurasia. What? Eurasia. Kind of question, but. Basically, it's the crossing between Europe and Asia. It's so big. But we can learn about them someday? Sorry? So you can learn about them someday? Yeah, we did learn about this in last month about Russia. So it's on our YouTube. You can go watch it there. All right, Dang. so let's move on to the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty is one of the most culturally flourishing dynasty as seen by my PowerPoint. Trying to recreate as big as much as possible. Basically it was thought of as it has lots artists. of good poets, it, right? A lot of good poets, a lot of great artists, and basically just a lot of philosophy and everything that has to do with cultural uh, importance and basically this is the actual renaissance of China where art is very important, philosophy is very important, and poetry is a lot of important, and anything that is beautiful and arty. And But there wasn't really a lot of economic reform or there's not a lot of military uh, improvements. What's the, like in China, what's the difference between philosophy and religion? Good question. So we have philosophy, which is like Confucianism, and we have religion, which is like Buddhism. Buddhism basically is not just a way you live by, but also something that passed out right as a belief but confucian is basically kind of things that you should do it's not mandated buddhism is like this is something i have to do for example i have to be vegetarian it's something like very abstract and not really any substantial nonsense. yeah a bit of nonsense but also there is some like uh, thinking behind it but usually confucianism is based on logic philosophy uh yeah that's 618. Yeah, sorry. This is 618. 
to 907. So 300 years, one of the longer years, the, uh, the fifth longest uh, basically culture in China and one of the most culturally flourished. Basically, as I said, poetry, painting, art, uh, religion, philosophy. Yes, Stephen? Um, like, I think it was like the most powerful one. Yes, it's also, it's probably golden there. It wasn't the most militarily powerful one, but culturally powerful, you can't that. We'll learn about later on who was the most politically and militarily powerful. Why does this basically the one that can that? fend off Mongolia, where basically everybody else did. Imagine yeah. if everybody back in the day had phones, like, like, like at the beginning of ADs, imagine that. Well, you can That's imagine what? everything. You should go write a book on everything you imagine. All right. Why does his eyes look that like that? That's drawings, right? And usually, actually, being fat back then was a good thing. What? Because being what? fat what? back then just meant that you had enough food to eat. Because yeah, so the emperor was usually really fat because they could eat as much as possible, and right. yeah, she was the empress. So also anything that she wanted to eat. So and the peasants were really weak because they had to work every day and usually they didn't have enough food. Well, it's 8.34 now. Does it matter if you have two chins? Uh, not, <laughs> not really. <laughs> but yeah, so Wu Zetian is the, basically the only empress of China that's powerful enough to rule by herself. She ruled through her, um, her husband and her son, but basically they were, again, puppets for her and she was the puppeteer that controlled everything uh, at the end and again she lived through basically the Tang dynasty from 665 to 690 which is pretty long rule. Pick your question you get one this time all right. Uh, I, that is like a long time ago in China woman or like the woman could not like be a, be an empress Yes, that's why she had to rule through her husband and her son because she can class end. She was what's called an empress. When does and class she end? A lot of people. When does class end? When does this class end? I don't know, in five minutes? What? A bit late. Uh, was it well known that she was the power behind the family? If you're in like the royal palace, yeah, but usually like the peasants. They don't really care about politics because they were busy feeding themselves, right? So yeah, people usually most people know, but I show so powerful that if you try to rebel against her, there goes your head. So yeah, not really a lot of things about her. One really important thing is she basically eliminated all corruption in her uh, in her dynasty, which is very impressive, especially as a person that is a, a, this puppeteer, right? A person that can't legally be is something that no other emperor could. She's, she's not an emperor. She is. She was the empress consort. That's what people call her. Basically, she would sit be, behind the emperor in the veil. And basically, when there was basically like meeting times for advisors, she would sit in the back and basically tell what the emperor to say. And yeah, basically under her and the Tang Dynasty, they were recognized as one of the most powerful uh, dynasties. She also killed a lot of people. Yes, but basically to prevent corruption. So all of those are usually bad people. All right, so let's move on to the Song Dynasty. Was she also a backstabber? Sorry? Was she also a backstabber? Stab actually. Mm, yes, because it's politics and there's always backstab to gain your position. All right, so as we were talking about the Song Dynasty, was technically the world's most powerful empire at the time. There was no other European empire as powerful as them. There's a lot of things that I'll be running through later on that made them so powerful. First is uh, art. Does anybody recognize what this is? I know it's kind of blurry. A long time ago. What are those three lines? So these is this one whole uh, art page. Very long, very big. Almost got burned uh, during the Qing Dynasty. Why the three pieces? No, it, it depicts the Great Canal, but the name of the piece is called the Qingyi Shangri. This is the original, basically built in. Not really. There's not really exact. Ten twenty-five to ten 
to around 1200, right? Because again, large piece, the details of this is impeccable. Nobody can ever recreate this piece anymore. It took- There's a COVID version. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, it shows people doing uh, nose uh, swaps. Yeah, so like, in, yeah, because in this one, everybody had a different thing to do because this basically depicted the whole city. You had uh, blacksmiths, you had, the emperor, I'm pretty sure the emperor is somewhere. It's probably and it's like kind of fine. Uh, what is that called? Where, kind of? where is Waldo? Yes, this is where is Waldo for old people for basically ancient times. And yeah, so very, very detailed. And all of the yellow you see was actually laced in gold. That's why it's also very expensive. Wait, it's gold? Yes, because that's how they got yellow colors either through sulfur, which stinks, and basically it's bad for you, or through gold, which this was a uh, piece for the emperor, so of course they used gold. They didn't have a budget. And sulfur is All right. really dangerous. Two, three, let's go through the most important things about this. So we talked about it, very powerful. Let's go through why. First thing is the examination system. As we talked about in the Tang Dynasty, we had a lot of uh, Confucianism and a lot of Buddhism. And that is something that they really high, uh, hold high in regard. So if you guys know what is something called the Chinese Great Exam or the Gao Kao in China, this is where it comes from, the Song Dynasty, where basically everybody had to take an exam. And the higher you rank up the exam, the larger your official position is in the government. So basically, again, because of, let's go back, her, Wu Zetian, and the reducing of corruption, this is possible through basically the Gao Kao of their time. And basically, if we were basically the number one, we're called the Zhuang Yun. And basically think about it as Summa Kung Lo Day, which is basically the top of the top. <laughs> uh, it's the only other way I can put it. All right, so another thing that's very important to the Song Dynasty was what made them very powerful, eating rice. They established eating rice in China. They're the first dynasty to be able to grow enough rice for it to be basically eaten everywhere in China. Before that, rice is actually really hard to grow because it's a water crop. It, it requires a lot of nutrition and care. But because of the powers of the Song Dynasty, the, basically the first time China has crossed 100 million people, they were able to grow rice. That's why we still eat rice today. I eat rice like every day. Yeah. So. And that's why my mom says not to waste rice. Yes. It's very hard to grow. And, Brandon, mm -hmm. and jokes aside, what actually made Song Dynasty very powerful was gunpowder. They were able to make gunpowder, which meant that they could make guns. Bamboo and, rockets. You know, guns kill people. And bamboo uh, rockets. And, yeah, bamboo rockets, yes. Anything that blows up. Goes but at that time, they goes. only used muskets, right? Yes, that's correct. Because, of course, they really couldn't have and machine guns. And fireworks. Yes. They so, had machine guns at that time. Imagine how powerful they would be. They yeah. would just gun down people like they had, wouldn't happen, right? Because you have to think, what Imagine if they had nuclear bombs back that time and then it would be like weird. Well, you should yeah, write a book like, about what you, you have to remember. Of. This is what basically every. And you would also have to have like hazmat suits to like yeah, handle the uranium. Of the scientific genre. Star Wars basically is what if. Uh, People from 2000, 2000 years ago had nuclear weapons and could fly. Ah. Right? Because you still had the robes, the very, very ancient attire, but they had powerful laser suits. Okay, that would be kind of sick was if that was a thing. For any science fiction written back in the This class N. Oh. Well, well, we created gunpowder, so alchemy existed. Like we had alchemy. Uh, technically, science did exist during uh, the Song Dynasty because Wait, can I, can they I? created they, they they actually created the first printing press, not the not the stupid printing bird that came five hundred years later. No, in the thousand AD, China created the first printing press. However, we didn't really have an alphabet, so you had to print like a thousand different words just to write a book uh, about like your daily life. And any book more like intricate, you had to have like a million different words, right? Because we had characters, so there's not really a way to print any book. Outside the most red, which is the four books and five classics. And oh, yeah. Wait, I did you know? Can I did you know that gunpowder was mainly made to make the king immortal? But if she ate it, it would probably do the opposite. That's thing. the same thing that they did with mercury, mercury, yeah. Oh, in, that's in the true. They, they, 
without drinking mercury every day, as basically like a daily dosage was supposed to make you immortal. No, the Qing they, Dynasty or the the Qing Shi Huang. The so first touching mercury can cause you to die. No, touching mercury does not cause you to die. That's what a you, you have unless you have a cut because mercury actually can't go through the skin. So if you have no cuts, your hands are perfectly clean. You can touch mercury, and they'll just come. Also, out. don't get it. I don't recommend eyes. it because, of course, like if there's a cut that you don't know about, you will get mercury poisoning. And also, eating too much tuna can also make you mercury. Poisoning. Wait, what? So stay off tuna. Yeah. I eat tuna. Okay. Not like just don't eat it like three course like. Well, well, my, well, my cat. Eat tuna. Cat, cat tuna are probably processed and like. Yeah. Like that's that. a different story. You should that's talk from you should talk to my like, your veterinarian about that. Not you're not a yeah. yeah. So, all right. So, again, I was talking about the four books and the five classes were basically the only books that were actually printed, and they were only printed for basically the emperor because printing pressures were expensive. They had to, because every word was printed on a block of metal, and metal was expensive because they just discovered how to create metal. What about and rubber? It, rubber didn't exist back then. Rubber is a 1800 century, basically a 19th century invention. And so this is rubber at that time. People delete the memory of rubber. That sort of is true. Uh, I'm, 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 I mean, I mean, you trees have like, maybe down south, like the Vietnam areas. But, um, yeah, like the Mayans had rubber balls to play with since like zero AD. But that's because where they lived, right? They were able to like make rubber balls from the trees, rubber trees. Rubber trees. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so like exactly Vietnam probably if they had rubber trees, yeah, they could make rubber. Well, yeah, but synthetic rubber that we know today. What the heck was that tree? Yes, that's what Mayans, right? The Mayans had rubber trees, and Vietnam probably had maybe a different type of it. I don't know. I just heard a scream outside. All right. Okay. Let's finish this off because we're. Bit over time, all right? So let's speed through the math. Oh, that's a lot. Six slides. Mongol invasion. Red, Mongol coming in, blue, people trying to flee. You see, red beats blue because there's much more red than blue. So therefore, Mongols was successfully able to invade the Song Dynasty. Mongol. Very simple. But Song Dynasty was the, actually the most powerful, and they held it off for 44 years. Where that's an unlucky number. A very unlucky number, but <laughs> yeah, so that's probably why they lost that year, right? So yeah, superstition, I don't know. But basically the Mongols went all the way to the left, you know, through Europe, all the way to, you know, the Poland. Poland, I think part of France. They stopped they, not left France. No, because like they have to like catapult their dead. Oh yeah. And but they also went down to Egypt. You have the Library of Alexandria, which they burned because of course they did. They're Mongols. They're like they're 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 Mongols, but yeah, they didn't, they didn't read, man. Like, you had Genghis Khan or Genghis Khan, however you want to pronounce it. We would just thought, yeah, stab, stab, I would. <laughs> and 5% of people uh, people right now are actually descendants of Genghis Khan. So that's how many children he had. That, that he basically. Bro. Yes, six, five, per, yeah, yeah, one in 20, right? Of your yeah, Chinese. Chinese, yes, sorry. Yeah, so a lot of people. That are basically you can trace it if you do a DNA test, you can trace your route back to take this out. It's kind of cool. Also class end. Also kind of terrifying. What if you're, you're a murderer? What if your great great granddad is a murderer? Yeah, exactly. Murder 10% of the whole. What if the background. Mongols invaded now? Reverse climate change and all the people. That is that is up that is up to debate. Like you can't really tell that he reversed climate change, like 10% more. And back then there wasn't really climate change, right? So like, yeah. like, like say if you come here and slash 10% of people now, maybe, maybe he's seen as the hero for half the people, for the people that survive, right? But yeah, so the why the Mongols don't do it now is because well, we're born now, they don't. So we just point the guns at them and well, we don't just we just say no, you're not you're not doing anything. And oh, this is dumb. Mongols Pew, are like one people under. They had uh King of Sky. Which was this like brutal guy that can do anything they want, I and everybody else was like just yeah. they even lost China. They all completely overtook China, absolutely obliterated the thirty million uh, army with just four hundred forty thousand. Sorry, I saw, I saw, 50,000 people obliterated a thirty million uh, people <laughs> army. What is 
just that. <laughs> yeah, like, you just do that, and you can't even keep the song that I see. So, like, basically, the one hit wonder. After King is gone, I said the one hit wonder was from One Pan Punch Man. Yes, exactly. You watch but, it? I physically lose to numbers like that. Just keep saying they, they literally just stood in the line. And uh, their basically their final battle was in this the Trenjol, and they had they had uh, how many votes? I wrote this down. Were they uh, just so. standing in line waiting to be killed? Uh, I didn't. Okay, I didn't write this down. But basically, they had ten times their um, navy and much more powerful, and they had they had cannons, they had gunpowder where Mongols didn't, and it was basically their mass death in on the water. And but their boats were literally like chained together for some reason. So the Mongols just came in in tiny ships and just shot arrows at them and the whole thing just burned up. <laughs> so basically they're so basically they thought that the Chinese were like <laughs> so they deserved Yeah, exactly. Where is the military? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they stood in a line waiting to be killed. How they couldn't <laughs> burn, right? Like it, it's like yeah. guerrilla warfare. How can you turn? Guerrilla like, warfare. Oh biological. What is guerrilla yeah, so warfare? So they're, so they're, so their ships, they're not like, oh, we're going to be strong, we're going to become a wall, we're going to make each other up, like, permanently. That's so like, what is like jungle warfare and, and like bird, urban warfare. Well, all the other things just be chugged down. Yeah, exactly. So they all die. So if like there, you have three, if you have. All right. Oh. I, think you to make last I know how to reload a musket. They can protect it. No, not high man. Here, Angel. Pride and shot one. Their last time on an island. Why not? Yeah. They were trying to get to us. And they couldn't make it. And you have to remember, before here, they only successfully went to Korea once. That was during the Tang Dynasty that they were able to successfully invade. Like, sorry, no, sorry, that's absolutely false. It was actually after the Mongols took over that they were able to conquer Korea. So they had absolutely no idea how to sail their ships. They were absolutely dumbfounded by water. They thought we're just. Gonna... That's why they never expanded this, right? We see the Europeans as soon as they got rid of themselves, like the hands of like huge boats, just sending like. Thousands of people out and say, Yes, find this new land that I don't have anything about. You might come back, you might not, whatever. But, there, but the Chinese are like, Nah, this is our border. We're just going to go this way. Right? Go willow warfare. Yeah, so that, that's why they never expanded. And why the navies were basically trading ships, too. So they never had a lot of firepower. What does guerrilla warfare even mean? So basically, oh, I think I know it's like attack, run away. Exactly. Repeat. Good. All right. One question per slide, all right? Or no. one comment. Yes. Yes. Or no comments at all. All right. So we had the Yuan Dynasty, which is the first dynasty that's not owned by Han Chinese, if you can call that, and run by Kublai, Kublai Khan, one of the thousands, hundreds of thousands of kids of the, uh, the emperor. Genghis Khan? Of Genghis Khan's grandson, basically. So at that time, yeah, probably hundreds of thousands of people were related to Genghis Khan. And he was able to win uh, Mongolian. What and does civil China. war mean? I said civil so war. So Mongols fighting Mongols, because you have to think, hundred thousand of Mongols all fighting for one seat, right? And he won part of it, so he, he was basically given China. And now he created China's capital to Dadu, which is a dialect I don't understand, but Dad, it's technically just speech. Dad, and they created the Yuan Dynasty and basically merged themselves with the Chinese culture. Was there anyone who took control of China before, like during? The oh, I saw Marco Polo. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tengus Khan. It was just it was just it was just a bunch of Mongols fighting. Kong. Oh, so like Kong. when he died, the civil war started, or like yes, exactly, yeah. Kong was. Yeah. Kong. So basically, uh, the Han and again they, they were very successful, but they did one thing wrong. They became a dictatorship and they started doing racial profiling. Which we all know is the downfall of every single country. They they racial profile Han Chinese people and basically push them as like racially insuperior and basically insignificant, and that's also why they lost. But one thing that they did was they were the first ones to use paper currency instead of like actual tokens made out of gold. Wait, gold? I don't see gold, bronze, copper, anything that they can get their hands of metal, right? So when does class end? Well. I guess I can end the class here, but if you guys want to stay, I have more stories to tell. So I want to it's up stay. to you guys. Stay. Uh, yeah, it's up to you guys. If you guys want to stay, I'm going to tell more stories. I guess, I don't know, if you guys find it interesting. But I think they might want to take a break. No breaks. We're almost done. All right. No, I'm tired. 10 more minutes. Does anybody know who this guy is? Marco Polo. Why did, why 
like the game called Marco Polo. Preston? He traveled. Like moved from like Italy, and then like traveled on the so-called all the way to China. Good question. So what? Which country? I traveled Close. from yeah. Italy. Close. What is the what is literally the smallest country? Vatican City. Yes. The Papal Why was there Why was there a game named Marco Polo? Is it because, because basically Marco Polo was this guy, the first European to travel to China and into basically Asia, and, and they have to send his letters back right every time. And you've written a book about it because think about it, Marco Polo. It's about blind. He was blind because they had no uh, way of communicating back then, and Marco Polo. Just basically saying that it's basically a way of saying, yeah, we received your message, right? I started but, with something Marco Polo had blindfolded. But technically, it really has nothing to do with it. Like, I think it, I started with like Marco Polo had blindfolded. All right, that's your one question. Arrows. Okay, that's your one comment for this mic. No more comments no. from you. All right, so let's keep going. So Marco Polo was just uh, basically from the Vatican or the, uh, the merchant, because again, he was a Christian missionary and he was an explorer, a merchant. Of course, he had to sell stuff to make his money because the Pope didn't, everybody except the Pope didn't really get paid much. And he traveled a road. Does any, can anybody guess the name of the road? Silk Road. Yeah, exactly. So he traveled the Silk Road. So, so, he traveled, so. also, he also met somebody Asian, I think. And then they went on adventures them both. And then Marco Polo and had to The adventures of Marco Polo, we couldn't really talk with Shura because that guy didn't exist in history. This guy did, everybody else did. The Silk Road is still here. Yes, but we call it the One Belt One Road because that's a communist. That's the communist government's initiative. Are there any parts of Marco Polo's story that have been proven to be true? No, his travels to. Okay, specifically, no. We can't really prove the specificity, right? Like any like specific detail, we can't really prove. Like. Meeting up a specific person, but him traveling to Asia, yeah, that's true. Because he was able to document things that nobody could. Like learning about gunpowder, learning about like the, the Mongolians uh, basically mixing with the Chinese. And yeah, and so basically. Still. And the silk, well, the silk road actually reached to Europe. And he was the only person that was brave enough to actually travel back. Usually it was just like uh, Chinese, Eastern people traveling to Europe to sell their stuff. And basically. And then they never come back. They some, yeah, basically. It's like a once in a lifetime thing. It took you like years to travel back. So most people didn't travel back. But and here's the only one that went the other way. Or one of the person that actually read a, wrote a book about it. It's, he, he rode a horse, right? Not a carriage. The, that I'm not sure about. Maybe both? Uh, I yeah. think a, riding a horse would suck. Yeah. So yeah, so Eastern, basically he wrote a book about the Eastern world. China, Persia, India, Japan, Korea, and basically learn about the Japan. Yes. So why uh can you go back? Sure. Where's the bathroom? So why yes. is his why is his pants like weird? That is a very that yeah, so that is kind of a design from you know back in the day. That's what people from Europe wore. That's it. So it was basically his, his his attire. It's like, why do you wear like sweatpants now? Why do you wear pajamas? Same thing, right? It's just, well, that's what people told us to wear. All right. So as I said, there was the Han Dynasty, right? And well, this is the last Han Dynasty. And we talked about the last dynasty, the Song Dynasty basically taken over. See here? Sorry, not the Song, what I'm talking about. The Yuan Dynasty and taken over by uh, King Khan and the Mongolians. And basically, we, oops, we go back to the Ming Dynasty, which is now back in the hands of the Han, or the Han Chinese, not the, not the actual Han family. So it was actually one of the longest lasting dynasties again, the fourth to be exact, lasting from 1368 to 1664. Exactly, yeah. That's unlucky again. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we can see a pattern now that maybe like, well, if, if you had if you lived through a 44, you're you're pretty lucky, but yeah, they lived through what is that two and they filled on the third one. So, so basically this is them. The name of the person is actually famous, the person that fam that that created everything. 
and basically the founder called Zhu Yuanzhang. And basically, again, China gave up unitarianism. I don't know why. Uh, it was partially because of its political system. They were very afraid of uprising, especially just after the Mongol Empire. How the, how the Ming Dynasty took over was through a civil war. So they were afraid that another civil war happened. Based, so basically, they took uh, apart all of their weapons and said, I basically scrapped all of the blueprints for future weapons. So at that time, they basically just stayed with art, trade, and literature. So that's why we have a very rich history, but not really a powerful. And yeah, so again, he led a rebellion, civil war really, and against the Mongols, and but won. And this, well, this is something else, but he actually created, he moved the capital, which is funny, from Beijing, Dadu, which is what the Yuan Dynasty wanted, back from uh, down to Nanjing. Yeah, so he probably shouldn't have moved it because just 200 years later, they moved it back up to Beijing. Just the annoyance. Yeah. He actually built this, the Forbidden City. Wait, in he, 1406. why was it Not called Forbidden? Why, why was it, it called Forbidden? Sorry? That has a foreign in it. Yeah. Like, oh. Forbidden. But it didn't burn down, so. Why was it called Forbidden? It, it was Summer Palace that got, uh, kind of. It got, it got invaded. It basically got rooted. But the oh, Summer's what? Palace is the one that basically uh, burned down. But why is it called Forbidden? Because it was basically, it was this huge city and only the emperor could go in. That's yeah. So what if anybody else, like the Pope, would? Well, there was still a Pope, right? Well, what if like a, like the second most important guy went in? You're fine. You had to have a pass. It's basically like entering Vatican City. Yeah. What's the point of making a big Vatican. city if there's Vatican. not going to be anybody living yeah. there? It's not even called a city. Not, not, so yeah, so you were about it, right? But of course, you have to announce yourself first and like send people ahead. Half of them probably won't make it because you know that that's like back then horses die, you die. And basically they will send like 10 different people to announce it, which probably like two or three make it. And the first Why one might be just a trans knock pass? their head off because they, usually they think that if there's only one that made it, it was a prank by somebody. So they might even have two sending it. Uh, because of course not everybody makes it, right? And well, they had to be very secure because Ming Dynasty was a really powerful military. Wait, what if just a transpasser went in and had a cannon and blew a hole in the well, because wall? Because you have to remember, ten, back then, technology was huge, right? We didn't make things small. It wasn't handguns. Your gun was like half your own life, so. What if they had like a they port didn't. portable cannon? You know, you'll see that, right? You'll see that, and you'll, you'll die before you actually get there. There was like gates among gates before you actually get to see that. Like five doors? It's like getting on a plane. Do you think you can bring your cannon on the plane? Can you just break no, you the plane? All right, so let's just keep going, okay? So let's talk about, we're speed running about a bit of this, but let's move on to the last dynasty of China. Do you have a timer? No. Xin Dynasty. Do, do, do. But then that's um, not called speed running. You can count. Yes, no, I have a timer right here, all right? I have a timer right here. You don't have to- What's called speed right? running? So let's just finish this off with the Qing Dynasty, which is the last Chinese dynasty and the Mongol dynasty that wasn't ruled, that wasn't ruled by the Han people. This was actually ruled by Manchus. Mr. Mongols. Sounding like, man, man, like the Mongols, but no, from Manchuria. Very creative, I know. Manchuria, what? My or dad the came from Ontario. Oh, that makes uh, Is that the Qing dynasty? So basically, northeast of the Great Wall, and they're the, basically the only people that broke through the Great Wall and conquered China. Which I don't know why they could have just walked around. But... <laughs> yeah, so. They probably didn't know they could walk it was around. A, it was a. It was basically a good and a bad. And let's just look at this for it. So. The Manchuria and the last dynasty, the Qing dynasty, was actually ended off pretty What's horrendously. What's Boxer Rebellion? <laughs> yes, so we had the Opium Wars, right? The first Opium War from 1840 to 1852. I believe they also have a that Yeah, but I mean, I'm lucky for which side. I'm lucky for the Chinese, yes. Very successful for the British people. 
they got the Chinese basically addicted on opium. Uh, the reason for that is because China is didn't, the, Qing, the Qing dynasty didn't want opium to trade. They're like, we don't want your foreign goods in. So how the, basically how England at the time tried to cripple China and cripple their defenses was by sending an opium. What's opium? What's opium? A drug. They were self-reliant, so they tried to make them rely on them. Yes. So they thought that if they, and because China didn't create opium, they thought that if we send them opium, they're now going to be relying on the British colonies for opium, which meant that they had to open to trade to get the opium in. What or if they, create a black market. What if they just exploded the opium? That's what they did. But uh, that leads to the second opium war. They tried to blow up the opium. Of course, you blew up their stuff. Do you think the British people will be very happy about it? No, and then no they so they just killed, leading to this, 25 million dollars, 25 not million. 25 million people dead. And then they start sending them more opium. Yeah. All right. So, again, yeah. So, because it became like a set, so because of this, it became kind of a semi colony. We have like Hong Kong, but it also became like a semi feudal uh, uh, territory because, well, there wasn't really an emperor. The emperor also got addicted to that thing. And Ew. Oh, yeah. So China falls apart here. And then no, we go okay. into well the Boxers Rebellion is also this rebellion, which is like uh, martial arts people. So a bunch of people that are like a boxer try to fight back. And of course they also feel miserably. They're actually backed up by the Emperor Cixi. Or sorry, Cixi, Cixi Tai Ho. And and she technically was like saying that, yeah, like funding the whole thing, that they still had bit left uh, from the actual empire. But again, this failed, this failed. The British succeeded. They got Hong Kong as part of their, basically their booty, or their war bounty. And yeah. So that's it really about the Qing Dynasty. I already talked about kind of the last emperor and he really led the sad, sad life. Can Why is it called Hong Kong? What is it called? Hong Kong? King is no, because Kong? that came from like Chinese, right? It's Xiang Kong. And I don't know. Yeah, from Hong Kong. Oh, it's okay. Frederick Harbor. Oh, yeah, Frederick Harbor. It's supposed to smell nice and then before, they, yeah. before the old. Yeah. Oh. Before the opium. Before opium. Nice. Before opium? Yeah. Before opium? Yeah. Does it still smell nice? Or does mm. it smell like cigarettes? No, because they've packed so uh, it's real estate, right? It's the only basically what they call uh, self-governing place of China. So a lot of people like to go there to work. Like that. So it becomes basically downtown. You see crackheads everywhere and things like that. But, and homelesses. And you, people like live in like a one by one uh, square, square meter room. And that's it. That's so small. Sorry? Cali Wall City. Yeah. So, yeah, and that will lead to the last emperor and the civil war, which I guess is kind of self-explanatory. The civil war being, of course, the basically they had the nationalist, which was sponsored by the US and all the European countries coming in and basically trying to set up a new government of a, de a democratic government after they saw the success in Hong Kong. And of course in Macau, which was Spanish, but oh, that's, that's a different small. story. And yeah, so the last emperor sad story Basically, became emperor when he was seven, got kicked out when he was eleven, got sent to like Manchu, became this puppet emperor until like he was twenty-five, and after that, he became a, 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 a library, a teacher, but basically uh, somebody that is a laughing, a, a laughing stock. Yes. Isn't, isn't Macau like part of Portugal? Portugal, Spain. Uh, like, Portuguese. They're Portuguese. Sorry, that's where Portuguese was. Sorry, not 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 Spanish. Spanish. I, I don't know. I've been, I've been reading on the Spanish in so maybe that's not fine. And yeah, so we have the Civil War. The Nationalists, of course, clicking over, and we have the Communists again with the guerrilla warfare and everything taking over, and that's the government we have Thank today you. in China. All right. Any questions before we end it off? I know it's yeah. a longer class. Thanks everybody for staying behind. Yeah. Do you have any predictions for the next two thousand years of China? Yeah. <laughs> next predictions. I have a feeling the communist government will be first. 
either peaceful transition or another military battle. I mean, tools that matter. Why can't military it? battle is usually what things get done, but I don't know, right? Because now with so like advanced uh, technology, maybe something can change. Maybe what? the only way forward is peacefully because it's too deadly for uh, a lot of people to die. You don't think the can hold on with this force? They can, but they, they have to change. They have to give. And if they give, they're not, are they truly communists, right? Wait. Uh, should, what is that analogy? That, 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 no, no, it's a philosophy. Some, some, uh, somebody ship. Ship Theseus? Yeah, ship Theseus, right? If you change the communist government so much, is it still the communist government? Nope. Yes. It's not really being communist in the day. Yes, so, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, you keep replacing piece by piece, right? You allow democracy, you allow foreign trade. You allow for investments, right? You're saying you change, 10% you change certain, That's fine. You change certain things about it. It's just still. Can we leave <laughs> now? Government, right? Ship up these seats. They're asking if you but, can wait. They can yeah. leave. All right. So thank you, everybody, for staying for like an hour and a half. I know there was some technical difficulties, but thank you all for joining me for basically, I would say, the last session before the summer. I'll be away for university next year. So. Well, teaching the class will be pretty rare. So thank you, thank you everyone for for allowing me this opportunity.